let's introduce our first speaker. Dr. Armstrong, Shalimar Armstrong, is an environmental soil scientist and associate professor in the Department of Agronomy at Purdue University. His research program investigates the agronomic, environmental, and economic impacts of current and emerging regenerative ag practices. Dr. Armstrong's research is executed on multiple scales, ranging from soil micro, uh, microbiome to the evaluation of conservation practices on watershed scales. Further, his research provides adaptive management solutions at the farm gate to maximize profit while minimizing environmental damage. Let's welcome Get those crowd interaction hands going on. Dr. Shalimar Armstrong. First of all, thank you, Rita, for the introduction, and thank you, NREC and Julie Shaney, for um, this opportunity. I'm going to be talking about nitrogen, fate, and dynamics in a sustainably intensified agriculture system, meaning uh, a system that wants to maximize profit uh, while minimizing environmental damage. And so I like to start with the uh, soil nitrogen cycle. Some of you uh, in your undergrad, you might have a flashback of having to uh, recite this cycle. But the reason why I want to start here uh, is because I do a lot of work in cover crops, as you know, and um, cover crops influences this cycle. Uh, so this cycle is made up of inputs, uh, transformations within the soil, and then outputs. Uh, and so when you think about it, cover crops influences many uh, portions of, of this cycle, okay? And so you can see here I've highlighted uh, some of those. And so we're just going to walk through a narrative that talks about how cover crops impacts uh, the, these portions of the cycle, or these transformations in the cycle. We've quantified some uh, dominantly with funding from, from NREC. And so uh, the first two fates that we'll be talking about is, uh, you know, surface uh, runoff of, of nitrates. And many people don't quantify that, okay? But nitrates do leave through surface uh, runoff and surface discharge. And then there's also uh, what we really know about uh, and, and care about is tile drainage uh, losses of nitrogen. And so we're going to do that by looking at uh, some of the long-term results from the cover crop and nitrogen management uh, experiment site in Lexington, um, uh, Illinois, I almost said Indiana, Lexington, <laughs> Illinois, uh, that was established when I was an assistant professor at Illinois State. It was established in 2014 with funding purely from uh, NREC. And so we have in, uh, intensely tiled about 20 acres uh, to where we can have five treatments replicated three times independently tile drained and monitored. Uh, and, and this uh, was one, this is the longest standing project of its sort uh, in, in the state, okay? So one of the first things you, you'll know about how cover crops perform on the landscape when you include them into your corn and soybean uh, systems is that they reduce the inorganic nitrogen that's susceptible to being lost by tile. And so you see that black line and then you see the green line that's significantly different and shifted uh, from, from the black line is, is indicating that when we grow like a cereal rye dominated mixed cover crop on the landscape, it's significantly reducing the amount of nitrate that could be lost through the tile drainage. Okay, that's the first step. Okay, and then, you know, as that cover crop begin to grow, uh, the next step of performance is that it's possible that that cover crop can reduce the volume of nitrate uh, the, the volume of discharge coming from tile drainage, right? So the sheer volume of water leaving the system. And so what we calculated uh, from over nine years, from 2015 to 2023 at that Lexington site, is that there's a 23% uh, less discharge or drainage through tile drainage um, with corn and soybean plus the cereal mix versus just corn and soybean by itself. Right, and that's significant because if, if nitrate moves with the water and you're losing less water, there's less opportunity to lose uh, nitrate from the system. So first of all, you are reducing the amount of nitrate in the system, in the soil system, right? Uh, and then secondly, this cover crop is reducing the amount of water leaving the system, okay? Next, we'll look at the third impact, and that is the concentration 
of nitrate in the water. So this is flow weighted nitrate concentration. Um, and you can see that when you, in the presence of cover crops, there's a 37% reduction in the amount, in the, the nitrate concentration in the tile water. So uh, milligrams of nitrate per liter is, we reduced that by 37%. And this is the average over those nine years from 2015 to 2023. When you put it all together, right, you get something like this. Okay, and this represents the cumulative loss. So every time it rained over those nine years, we added, we quantified and added the amount of the load of nitrate leaving the systems based on their different treatments. And we found that there was a 42% reduction in the load of nitrate loss over a nine year period where we used cover crops, a cereal dominated mix relative to just corn and soybeans by itself. Now, you might be wondering what's that gray line represent? That's the zero control. That's when we added no cover crops and no nitrogen, but just grew corn and soybean, okay? Uh, we did that to see if a, if a farmer added zero nitrogen, uh, how much loss would there be? And you can see it rivals that of when farmer, the farmer adds 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, okay? Why is that? Well. Uh, that plant is not healthy if it's not receiving the right nutrition, and so it can't put a, dim a demand on the nitrate in the soil solution. In other words, we have a high organic matter soil, 3.4% organic matter. It's mineralizing nitrate that's going into the soil solution that could be lost, and this plant doesn't have the energy or, or, or the capacity to put a demand and take up that nitrogen, so it's being lost. You also see that that correlates with the amount of water loss. So it's not using water as efficiently as a healthy plant. So therefore, that's contributing to loss. So this is all about, these last couple of slides were all about the fate of losing uh, nitrogen from the system via tile drainage. But what about uh, when you think about the, uh, nitra uh, nitrous oxide loss, N2O, right, versus nitrate? And so, we did a study, we were funded to do a study, again, by NREC, 2017-2018, uh, and we just published this, um, where we looked at the total inorganic end loss from the system. Well, partial, right? We looked at losses from uh, tile drainage, that's with nitrate, and then we looked at losses through the atmosphere, like emissions, uh, and that's the N2O. And what we found, uh, we looked at a corn and soybean rotation. And what we found is that in 2017, the corn year, we had about above average cover crop biomass, about 2,400 pounds per acre uh, that year, one of our best years. And we saw a significant reduction in nitrate loss and a significant reduction in the amount of N2O that was being emitted. Now, we had good growth in that first year, right? Uh, and it had a high carbon to nitrogen ratio meaning that it broke down very slowly. So we, get, we got no, well, little or minimum nitrogen released from that residue in 2017, but if you track forward into the soybean uh, year in 2018, you start seeing that green starting to show up in the cover crop treatment. That's because we're losing N2O when the cover crop residue breaks down. It's not even denitrification, it's just uh, decomposition that's occurring. And in that, in that process, you do have uh, the fate of losing N2O. Uh, but, but then, when you look at it across both years, and you average across a corn and soybean year, two years, uh, which is one phase, uh, first of all, one thing that we noticed is that 86% of the inorganic end loss is in the form of nitrate. That's your biggest corporate, okay? 86%, we, we're losing it through the towel. Uh, and then the remainder is being lost uh, through N2O, okay? But when you look across two year, a two-year average, we're getting uh, greater than 50% reduction in nitrate loss and N2O loss, or, or total inorganic end. Which then, if you equate that to the environmental cost, uh, damage cost, that's also a 50% reduction in the presence of, of cover crops, okay? Uh, that was on a plot scale. When you think about uh, funded research on uh, a watershed scale, this is the Lake Bloomington Watershed Pair Project, where we cover cropped 50% uh, of one watershed, and we paid individuals not to cover crop in, in the, the other watershed that was about 770 acres. We then um, monitored, uh, automatically monitored nitrate loss uh, as it at the export sites. Um, and, and, and basically, we were able to determine what's the impact of cover crops when you have no control, 
what's the impact of cover crops on a watershed scale? So we're not talking about a plot with 1.5 acres. No, we're talking about 1,100 acres versus 770 acres, right? And so uh, here's an image, a graph of the flow-weighted nitrate concentrations. In black are the non-cover crop, it's the non-cover crop watershed, and in green is the cover crop watershed. And when we first started this project, we didn't have much difference in the flow-weighted nitrate concentration, but uh, when you cover crop consecutively over time and that, that system begins to mature, uh, we start seeing reductions similar to that of on, on the plot scale. And so you start seeing towards the end, let's say in 2021, up to 2023, you start seeing uh, drastic reductions in the flow-weighted nitrate concentration. And just like on a plot scale, that then leads to reductions in load. And so we, we uh, quantified reductions in load of 33 to 48% reduction, right? And now, this is when we cover crop only 50% of a watershed, right? And we're getting similar numbers uh, to when we cover crop 100% of an acre. Of, of a plot, okay? And so uh, that's on a watershed scale, and that is uh, thinking about the fate of losing nitrogen through the tile drainage. But what about on the, the soil surface? We found that a significant portion of the water that's moving and being exported from a watershed is not through the tile drainage, but it's through the surface runoff. So then how does cover crops affect nitrate loss uh, when you consider the amount of water. You can see these are two examples from uh, that watershed study when we were out in the rain and we took these pictures. That's a lot of water moving. A, a significant percentage of what's lost annually is lost through a couple large surface events. So we wanted to see what's the impact of cover crops. And so we were able to advance this study with um, another round of, of NREC funding and not only measure uh, and quantify what's leaving through the tile drainage, but also you can see these grass waterways uh, that, that are really nice uh, in both of our watersheds, the control and the cover crop watershed. And the surface water flows uh, to these grass waterways, then they converge, and where you see that yellow star, we are measuring uh, the tile loss, and we under the concrete culvert, under, under the, the road, we also have instrumentation uh, embedded in that concrete uh, where we're measuring the, the, the flow and the nitrate and phosphorus loss uh, from surface flow. And then we're able to separate the two and then combine them to look at the impact. And this is what we get. This is an example in 2000, July 9 through 12, rainstorm event, 1.4 inches of rain. Uh, during that time, the event lasted for uh, three to four days. This is in 21. What do you see? Basically, you have a significant portion of 76% uh, of the drainage occurred through surface runoff and only 24% uh, through tile drainage. So where are you going to lose most, most of your nitrogen? Even if the concentration is lower, when you have that significant difference or differential uh, in the volume that's leaving through the different paths, the one that has the largest amount of water leaving, even with a low concentration of nitrate, uh, results in the uh, larger amount of nitrate load. And so you see that on, on the other graph, where um, even with the reference, uh, we had about a 24% reduction or so um, in nitrate load for the, the cover crop watershed, where we only cover crop 50% relative to the, the reference watershed, where we didn't uh, have any cover crops growing. The same thing, we captured another huge storm uh, in 2023, and we saw a 38% reduction in total nitrate loss uh, while that cover crop watershed is larger, so it exported 24% more discharge, more drainage. So more drainage, but because of the, con the conservation on the surface uh, and getting that coverage, we have less total uh, nitrate loss where we had cover crops on only 50% of the watershed. Okay, let's now transition into fates of loss, uh, fates uh, of nitrogen or nitrate um, in, in field, in field. So we're looking at fixation from cover crops, scavenging from cover crops, and then releasing that, that nitrogen from the residue uh, in, so that the plant can get it, the corn, soybean can get it, and then produce a profitable yield. Okay, so normally this is the image that we are used to Right, we want to uh, uh, 
uh, fly in or intercede the cover crop within the standing, uh, let's say soybean before corn, this is cereal, and, um, and then we're gonna harvest that soybean and then plant the, let the cover crop grow, terminate it, then plant the corn. And so we've been studying some of the challenges of the most common cover crop, that's cereal, and then planting corn behind it. Uh, and so this is kind of what we've found in general, and we've been working from that point to try to offset some of the losses that we're seeing. So uh, when you have a grass growing before grass, you have some carbon tie up, maybe some alleliopathic uh, uh, antagonistic relationship happening, but we, we definitely quantified that there was about a, a 60 pound reduction in nitrogen uptake by the corn when it's following cereal, right? That equated to about a six to 13% reduction in corn yield, right? That's a very expensive trade-off. Uh, to put cover crops on the landscape. So we, we looked further into it, and we found that on a field-based N15 study, again, funded by uh, NREC, that you get about a 9 to 12% recovery of cereal residue in in the corn or soybean by harvest. That's not a lot, right? That's not a lot. So the cereal is very stingy. Then we looked at uh, what's the contribution from the different parts of the cereal, right? Uh, where you think about the shoot, contribution versus the root contribution. And um, basically what you see is that flat line at the bottom, that's the root contribution. So basically no contribution in the subsequent growing uh, year behind cereal termination from the roots. Most of the contribution happened from the shoots. And that's because of a difference in possibly the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So when you put it all together, we found that there's about a 40 to 60 percent reduction, a reduction in, in nitrogen that we need to figure out, a 40 to 60 pounds per acre uh, nitrogen a challenge that we need to figure out, right? We need to do some type of management to determine how can we overcome uh, that, that nitrogen challenge. And so we started working uh, in 2020 to look at what happens if we put uh, uh, overwintering legume before corn instead of cereal. And you can see here we have on the y-axis, the vertical axis, corn yield uh, in bushels per acre. And then uh, on that horizontal axis at the bottom, we have uh, increasing nitrogen rates, okay, that we added. We had a balanza clover, we had crimson clover, we had no cover crop, and then we had oats and vetch. If you just focus on where the zeros are, right, uh, where you added zero side dress, Look at the difference between the blue line, which is balanza clover, and the rest of the treatments. That's because you're getting some, uh, some, some nitrogen release and uptake from the fixation of the balanza clover that's getting into the corn. And the corn is using it to produce more yield with lower amount of nitrogen. So we leveraged that funding uh, to then uh, get a, a North Central Sale grant myself uh, Amir Sangapur and also um, Dr. Andrew Marganat. And so basically we're working across both states and we're doing things like this. Uh, we, we have fact treatments, with, uh, experiments with factors of cover crop species, right? Balanza clover versus cereal planting method, okay? Uh, conventional versus precision. We have John Pike here who was one of the pioneers of that. And then cover crop seeding rate. Full rate versus a reduced rate. How much cover crop seed do you need to get the biomass that you, that you need, right? Okay, um, so basically what we found is that when you look at cover crop performance as far as biomass and end uptake, there was no impact of seeding rate. That's important. So I can apply 50% less seed and still get the same performance of that cover crop. Okay, uh, there was no impact of how we planted the cover crop. So you can plant uh, full width with a drill or you can plant the strips in pre with precision planting with the, the lower rate, but you get the same production. Okay, uh, this is just showing the difference in the CNN ratio, about 10 for balanza clover, which is excellent, meaning that you'll get quicker turnover and uh, upwards to 18 for the cereal, where well, we also have seen in the field that leads to immobilization of end. This is just a, a, a shot of uh, what it looks like, and we are now in central Illinois. We're in Champaign County. This video was taken, and this data is coming from Champaign County, okay? And so you can see we have pretty good clover. You can see the precision strips that we were planting into. And so how does that translate as far as yield? All right, two things I want to point out. Number one, 
You see the red bar, that's the no cover crop uh, treatment. It has the highest yield, okay? And you look all the way to the end where you have CCR full. That's uh, conventional planted cereal at the full rate. That's what we normally are. Look at the gap between those two. But when we change the species, instead of going cereal before the corn, we go balanza clover before the corn and then reduce the, the seeding rate, you move closer and you're more competitive to the non-cover crop control. So this tells us that it's possible for us to move the needle, right, uh, just by pulling the lever of species and then pulling the next lever of seeding rate, all right? We only had one balanza clover treatment that was uh, distant or significantly different from the uh, no cover crop control, and that's because there was heavy vole damage. And that's something that we have to manage when you get that kind of canopy because the hawks can't see the voles beneath that canopy. All right, so then we move to southern Indiana, and we see the same type of relationship. But in southern Indiana, you have more, re relative to Champaign County, right, you have more heat units. So your balanza clover takes off. We got about 3,000 pounds per acre of biomass. Uh, which then equated to maybe somewhere close to about 85 or so on average um, pounds of nitrogen in the biomass that we're going to try to convert into the corn. CRI, we controlled it. Uh, we didn't want it to get above 2,000 2, pounds per acre of biomass, but then it gave us about 30 pounds per acre of nitrogen in that biomass. Again, the red bar, no cover crop control. Now, uh, because we had so much biomass, and with the, with the Balanza clover, you see those are the two leading uh, winners here on this graph as far as corn yield relative to the no cover crop control. And then you had cereal there that's equal, but look, it's cereal planted with the reduced rate, right? So we reduced the amount of, of seeds that we're planting, so we reduced that stand density. Then we move forward uh, to another experiment where we had a factor of cover crop species, balanza clover versus cereal, planting method we just talked about, but the only difference here is the end rate. So we did those combinations across multiple end rates going from zero to 250 pounds per acre, okay? Um, here's a, just a shot in 21 of some of the, the biomass that we were able to produce with the balanza clover. You can kind of see what this stand looks like. I see a lot of concerned faces. That's a lot of residue. Yeah, and so uh, you have to have some kind of plan to deal with it, and we learned that. Uh, but look at what we were able to do with that Balanza clover, 118 pounds per acre of nitrogen on average uh, in the biomass, and for cereal, it was only 45 pounds per acre, and we controlled the cereal uh, to 2,000 pounds per acre of biomass. This is just a shot. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a shot I want to show you. Of. So we learned that we have to control, or we have to be conscious of how we deal with this biomass and how we terminate and how close do we plant to termination of the balanza clover to get the real uh, production right out of that, get the nitrogen out of that biomass from the clover into the corn. And so when we planted green in 2021, I'm gonna show you the results of that. And then we planted brown green, right? We let it get brown and start decomposing before we planted in 22. Planting green in 21, you still see, uh, so the orange and, and the orange and blue line represent the balanza clover treatments. The red is the non-cover crop control. Disappointed that there was no separation there, but was excited to see the significant gap and difference and increase in yield where we had balanza clover before corn relative to cereal. And that persisted all the way up to about 150 pounds per acre. Okay? So that was planting green. We think this is a picture showing what was left over at harvest. Significant amount of that residue did not really decompose that year, okay? And so we didn't have a good flush that we were looking for, a good release of nitrogen from the Balanza clover uh, residue, possibly because I think we could have waited a little longer and let it start decomposing before we planted, right? And that's what we did in 2022. And all of a sudden, you see now the separation that we really need, right, to, to make this thing more profitable for farmers. Uh, Balanza clover is significantly greater than the non-cover crop control, which is significantly greater than one of the cereal treatments, right? And that persisted up, up into 150 pounds per acre uh, added. To get to the same yield, uh, you need it for a conventional cereal treatment, you needed 100 pounds more nitrogen. 
That's the difference that, that, that we're able to quantify, and we're going to continue to tweak that system. I want to kind of close with this thought. Um, this is the one time precision planted really paid off. In 2023, it's characterized by early drought, right, and late rains. And so um, you see conventional balanza clover at the full rate, and we planted the cover crop across the skip row for corn, okay? Versus precision balanza clover, where we had to reduce weight, we cut the rate in half, and we only planted, we planted and left a skip row, so we didn't plant where the corn was going to go. That's significant because when you have a clover, you want it to grow as long as possible so it can produce those nodules and, and fix nitrogen. But when you don't know a drought is coming, you can get in trouble, right? Because it's using water as it fixed that nitrogen. And so it basically depleted the water resource um, uh, where you have the convention, conventional balanza clover. But where we had precision balanza clover, uh, there was still enough water for a good germination to happen and good vegetative, early vegetative growth. And you think that that wouldn't translate, that things would catch up, but it did not catch up, okay? You can see the orange is the precision planted versus the conventional planted balanza with twice the seeding rate. Um, it, it never caught up, okay? No matter how much nitrogen we added, it never caught up. How does that track relative to the other treatments? Um, basically, we, we saw that balanza clover, where you had lower nitrogen added, had an advantage, and then that advantage went away at about 150 pounds per acre, uh, and all were equal except the conventional balanza clover uh, at, after that point. So I will not summarize because I would like to take some questions, but you can read the summary uh, <laughs> as, as we uh, discuss. The date on the 20, the runoff I'm concerned about, the service runoff, okay, on the, the 23 date, yeah. what was the timing of that, what month? You didn't have that on the slide that I saw. Oh, that's a good question. So the 23 is actually a summary. So in 21, I showed one big rain event. Yeah. In 23, I showed the annual averages, the annual okay. sum. So it was multiple um, rainfall events. Was that kind of later in the, it was later in the, in the growing season when these events occurred. Was any of that due to ammoniated phosphate? Now, the July one probably wasn't. But what, what was the source of the nitrogen then? That's a great question. Um, I know that in this watershed, some DAP went down, but they are dominantly doing side dress or fall applied nitrogen with, with anhydrous. And it may be with and without uh, inserve or inhibitor. But that's injected. So this was a surface runoff. Yeah, this, this is surface runoff. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, uh, just because you inject it at, at six inches doesn't mean that it can't move with capillary rise. So we would have had to have soil loss at the same time. Yeah. Did you have the, like, um, you collected total phosphorus then in that same sample, right? We have, we have total phosphorus and we, we are running it. We're having trouble because the phosphorus concentration is so low. We're trying to find uh, an economical <laughs> uh, option uh, to, to, that has a detection limit low enough to actually give us a good quantification. We haven't found that yet. Anybody got another question? I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's clear. What was your... It's on. It's on. Uh, your ideal... You were talking about seeding rates on rye. What was your ideal seeding rate? And did it make it, I noticed you, your highest corn yield was in southern Indiana on the poor soils. Uh, did the seeding rate make a difference whether you were in, in uh, unglaciated soils in southern Illinois, or southern Indiana, or the black prairie soils in Bloomington or Lafayette? Great question. So ideal seeding rate was about 40 pounds to the acre. And then when we did reduced, we cut that in half by 50% down to 20 pounds. And we got the same, excuse me. Same performance, same biomass, same nitrogen uptake, same um, carbon captured. As far as its effect on yield, we saw wherever we had reduced rate, balanza clover or cereal on uh, flat black soil or on hilly, um, you, you know, alpha soils in southern, southern parts of Indiana, we saw that when you reduce the rate and you precision plant, you have more of an advantage as far as yield. Not always significantly different, but to a farmer, not six to nine bushels means something.